Hi everybody, thank you for coming this evening. I'm Julia Hathaway, I work for the Sierra Club, and I am starting up a new campaign that's really an old campaign. But this campaign's time has come, and we are just beginning to reach out to the community and let people know that we will be launching in the early part of the summer. And it's a problem that some people don't know is still going on. Some people are acutely aware that it is still going on. But in years past, people like the American Lung Association and others have tried to take on this issue. But things are different now. Now we have alternatives, and now we just need the organizational and strategic vision to make the change that we want to see. So the issue is the health impacts caused by the pre-harvest burning of the sugar cane fields. My, um, my wonderful volunteer, Jim Ewing, and I were talking just as we were setting up, and um, one of the things that we were discussing is the fact that if you start at the eastern end of Southern Boulevard, you are in one world, and it's a very um, interesting, um, a singular, high concentration of wealth community. And if you just keep on driving west, you're in another world entirely, where people's lives are not so hopeful, and um, their health is not so terrific, because they are chronically exposed to the smoke that happens when the sugar farmers burn the cane in their fields. So, Sierra Club is committed to this new campaign, and um, we're calling it the Stop Sugar Field Burning Campaign. And I've had the, the opportunity to go out there and see how they do it. Most people just see it when it looks like this, when it's just a, a billowing cloud in the distance. And I remember this year, I, was, I happened to be out in Wellington, and I was at my riding lesson, and all of a sudden, this beautiful late, um, fall morning, there's this apocalyptic procession of gray on the horizon. And I'm like, Whoa, oh, they're burning. The burning has started. So this is what it looks like for most people. And how they do it is they're quite good at it. The uh, process of doing a prescribed burn is something that people become specialists in. And in this instance, as you can see, they have a little cart that they truck behind, uh, I guess that's a tractor of some sort, and it's drip torch. And the drip torch has a fuel that goes along a certain area that, uh, you know, a portion of a hectare or whatever section of a field that they want to go ahead and burn. And um, they do it uh, many, many times a day. The Florida Forest Service is the entity responsible for the permitting process. They, they, being the sugar growers, have to go online the day of and get a permit. The permit is not very complicated, but it does provide some basic information about wind direction and, and where they are going to be burning. So that if there is um, some sort of health impact to a particular community, the, the agency can hold the particular grower responsible. So uh, I have to caveat this by saying these are the burn permits in total that are offered to people like um, you know foresters, sugar growers. I have to still go back and research how many burn permits a day in Palm Beach County are sugar burn permits. It's a lot of acreage out there. A lot of people have a concept, but just a concept, it's over 440,000 acres out there in sugar. And no, they don't, they don't burn it all at once. They, uh, it, it's highly systematized but it's a big, big area. And it happens every year. It starts in October. It's still going on now this year, but it's likely to stop in just, you know, days. But it takes place seven days a week, including holidays. The only time they do not burn is at night for safety reasons, I believe. And this is what it looks like. A colleague of ours who lives up in Martin County, her husband has an airplane and occasionally will fly over the Everglades Agricultural Area. And as I said, it's um, a pretty, uh, pretty fascinating process, a very scientific process of doing the burn. It burns quickly, it burns really hot, but it also produces a lot of smoke. 
So what's the problem with that? The prospect of living in the smoke shed and enduring this every year, burns happening successively day after day after day, this means that it's going away from the production of sugar, but it's going towards people in neighboring communities. And as a matter of fact, it reaches quite a distance. And um, this is something that people are breathing and breathing and breathing and breathing. It primarily affects the most vulnerable, kids, the elderly, people with compromised immune systems. And this is from the county health department basically saying, okay, smoke is pretty bad. It's something that you, you, know, can, you can experience as a, a nuisance or it can be more serious for you depending on who you are and your, your, you know, the, the, the state of your health. But it's um, something that is definitely an irritant and it can exacerbate, exacerbate conditions that you already have. The bad stuff in smoke is the particulate matter, and it is the smoke and ash and tiny, tiny particles that you can't see. It is the result of an inefficient burn. No burn is completely effective. You always have something. And so particulate matter is dangerous stuff. Over the years, the Environmental Protection Agency has become stronger and stronger in, in how they describe the effects of particulate matter. You've got PM10 uh, and PM2.5, that's the uh, micromillimeter, I'm going to screw that up, but it's um, the, the diameter of each tiny, tiny particle. 2.5 you can't see. It's actually more dangerous because it lodges deeper in a person's lungs and is uh, associated with not only cardiovascular and pulmonary disease, but also, of course, respiratory illness. Further, however, the Palm Beach County Health Department worked with EPA to fund a study at the University of Florida in 2010. And this study was kind of a breakthrough for Florida. A lot of other countries have focused on the health effects of burning sugarcane fields. But this was a laboratory study. And what they did was they assembled the technology to measure what they called the emissions factors. And so they burned the Florida species of sugarcane in an incinerator and measured what came off it. And the news is pretty horrifying, frankly. It's uh, harmful air pollutants that are regulated under the Clean Air Act, formaldehyde. It's um, not only toxins, but um, some of the chemicals, chemicals are carcinogens. Of course, um, when you're breathing this day after day, year after year, you really, unless you have a situation where you are chronically going to the ER, chronically going to the doctor, you're, you're not having the, the state of your health assessed. So we really don't know what's going on out there. Other places have done a lot better. People like um, Brazil, Australia, who have big sugar industries have taken greater care. And these next couple of slides are just examples of some of the studies that we found when we were doing our homework in um, thinking about whether to launch this campaign. And you can find all this stuff on our website. So the evidence is there. It's not there as clearly for Florida. The soot also, also causes, and I mentioned visibility, it also causes environmental impacts. Um, it's, uh, it creates smog. It uh, contributes to some, in some degree, of course, that you have carbon emissions from it. But it also, uh, when it deposits in the ocean, it contributes to ocean acidification. So it's a whole long list of unlovelies. So as I mentioned, you know, me growing up, I, I never had any sort of respiratory problems. Um, people I know who have asthma can be debilitated by it for days. And um, I think that while people who have moved to Florida recently 
I have some concept that the smoke is not good. I don't believe people really understand what a lifelong problem it is for some communities. It's pretty close. This is what it looks like from a satellite. Um, the, I was trying to show Jim, I don't know exactly, but I think this might be Forest Hill. I think this is Southern. But in any event, this is the um, Loxahatchee National, Wild, National Wildlife Refuge. And um, what we have out there now, um, one very small upside of having all that development out there now is that it's just not the um, disempowered poor people in the Everglades communities who are being affected by this. And I, I know this sounds a little cynical, but it's people who have political recourse. And that's another thing that's changed. The, um, the folks that we've been talking to are very concerned about the health impacts. I was contacted by a gentleman who is a member of Sierra Club who lives out in Pahokee. And I said, I really appreciate your calling me. We're trying to understand what people are still experiencing. Thank you for telling me your story. Do you suppose we could get together? I'd like to meet you and I'd like to talk to you more about what we have in mind. And he said, listen, I appreciate very much that you're doing this and somebody needs to do this, but they have a way of scaring you out here. In another sort of illustrative story, we, Jim and I, were meeting today with some other volunteers who were describing what they experience. And one of our friends lives here in Lake Worth. And he said when the wind blows a certain way, he is um, affected such that he cannot open the windows during the best time of the year. And um, his asthma is something that he um, gets inhalers for and he has to make use of throughout the burn season. And uh, I've heard people say, oh yeah, it's here on Singer Island. I was recently up in Stewart talking to some folks and um, a new friend, a new volunteer who's one of the river warriors said, oh yeah, when the wind blows a certain way, I can tell they're burning. And I checked it out and it's true. I, um, I am afflicted every time they burn. So if you are vulnerable, you are vulnerable. The Florida sugar industry is pretty huge. We have a lot of acreage, we have some very powerful people, and the Florida Crystals Company is the Fonkel Brothers. They are very politically connected. The um, U.S. Sugar Corporation, I believe, and I'll have to check this out, but I believe the Sugarcane Growers Cooperative, which is a, um, a federation of smaller growers, are now a subsidiary of U.S. Sugar. They have um, a, a more formalized relationship now, where in years past they used to be independent of each other. So why do they burn? Well, um, unfortunately it comes down to profit, I do believe. When they burn, they lose all of what they call the trash. That's the industry term for it. You are left with the, you know, the leaves, the tassels, everything goes up in the air, and you are left with just the stalks that contain the sugar cane. And what that means is that the harvesters can move faster and the tonnage that you have to transport to the mill is considerably less. And so what both of those mean is more money. You would think that in the US, we're pretty advanced. We invest in our agriculture. We, um, you know, we, we intend to be leaders in most respects. However, when it comes to sugar growing, we are really a laggard. When you look at com uh, countries like Brazil, Australia, um, a lot of the other sugar growing countries uh, include China, Pakistan, Mexico, Philippines, India, Thailand. Particularly in Brazil, though, and Australia, they are in the vanguard, and they do what's called green harvesting, which simply means that they do not burn and they use the entirety of the plant. And this is what the combines look like. We learned today that the way that they do green harvesting, at least in Australia, is they have fans that blow off the trash of the leaves. And they can use that woody material either for mulch, which is really good in sandy soils, which is predominantly 
what we're moving towards in Florida because the muck soil is depleting here. They um, can recycle it into cardboard products, paper products. I have a friend whose caterer also works for one of the sugar growers and relayed to her that he was at the sugar grower's house one day and talking about an event and there was what looked like cafeteria cutlery on the table and they got to talking about it and that was an experiment where they were trying to see if they could make these forks, knives, and spoons out of the so-called trash. So it's really not trash, it's just one man's um, stuff to put up in the air, another man's stuff to make good use of. You can also um, burn it in an appropriate facility and make electricity out of it. In the instance of the Florida sugar growers, they do burn some of what they call the bagasse, which is the woody material left over from just the stalks. And so this is something that we believe is the way of the future. The, um, the use of sugarcane, trash, the gas, the entire plant in Brazil has made Brazil behind the US the world's largest producer of alternative fuels, in this case, bioethanol. And this is, this is what a trash plant here looks like. Or mulch. So, you know, it begs the question, why? Why are we subsidizing sugar with our health? Especially when they have a sugar subsidy and the price of sugar is fixed in this country. It's far above the world price for sugar. With the money that is in politics today, as a result of some recent Supreme Court decisions, it is exceedingly hard to push back in the political system, at the federal level, even the state level. And so what we are faced with is good old fashioned community insistence on change. And that's what Sierra Club does. We exist to think through issues that people tell us are important in their communities. And then we try to engage with communities to figure out what, how do we want to get there? How can we get there? What's the strategy? And once you figure out what the, the viable strategy is, what are the tactics that are going to be useful and effective? And in so doing, we exist to try to make people's energy, time, resources most um, utilized in the best possible way. So we are committed for five years. We have a comprehensive sense of what we're going to be doing. And what it really requires is building, first of all, the understanding across Palm Beach County that this is still going on. And yes, people are still being hurt. And that there is a way of moving things in a positive direction that not only will be better for people's health, but could actually be really productive for the sugar industry itself. They are not going to change without a push. We have to push. We have to organize. So, we need to grow a movement. Five years is a goodly long time. We need to bring political pressure to bear on our local electives and work up from there. We have to bring people to um, events and uh, strategic opportunities to bring leverage. And we have to um, simply get organized. So Jim is proving to be just a wonderful volunteer and now wonderful friend. And we and Elle and a number of other Sierra Club members get together maybe once a month. And we have dinner and we hang for a little while um, catching up on what the work has been during the course of the month since we met last. And then we figure out, well, what do we think is smart here? And towards the um, middle of the summer, we are going to be launching this campaign. And it's going to happen at what we're, calling it, what we're calling a Big Sugar Summit. And the Big Sugar Summit is a grassroots teach-in. It's an opportunity for people, anybody, everybody, to come and learn, hear from experts on various topics about water pollution, nutrient pollution, air pollution from sugar burning, what the subsidy means, what sugar does to your health, what sugar does with their workforce, and taking together 
we believe that the opportunity is here and that there is significant media interest that we can make a, a new voice, renew the call to move away from burning sugar and employ these new mechanisms and make a, make a better South Florida for everybody. Because whether you live north, south, it's there. And um, it doesn't have to be. We can all win. So you would like as many people as uh, possible that are listening, uh, that if they're affected, if their breathing's affected, or if they have adverse <coughs> uh, conditions due to this, adverse conditions due to the smoke or the burning, you would like them to get in touch with, with you? Yeah, thank you. Please, please call me, email me. We also have a website that just went up a couple of weeks ago. It's called www.stopsugarburning.org. And um, there is a way that you can click on and share your story with us. So we, um, we need to understand the breadth of this problem. We believed that it extended a certain distance, but now we believe that it extends a far distance. So also, you know, you're all more than welcome to come to one of the volunteer meetings, and I'll, um, we put that on Meetup. It's the Loxahatchee Group of the Sierra Club. 